So far in this unit, we've seen a number of important aspects of molecular structure for both covalent and ionic compounds. In this last lesson of the unit, we're going to focus in on molecular geometry and molecular polarity, which is relevant to covalent small molecules, typically involving nonmetals. And our goal here is to be able to work from a Lewis structure all the way through to a geometric description of the molecule in three dimensions, and then inferring the polarity of the molecule, whether it possesses a dipole or not, based on the geometry and the types of atoms involved. So this may sound like a lot of gibberish right now, but by the time we get to the end of this series of videos, you'll be able to go from a Lewis structure all the way to the conclusion of whether a molecule is polar or not, which is going to involve figuring out the geometry of the molecule, the bond dipoles, and understanding how the bond dipoles add together to produce an overall molecular dipole moment or not. First, let's start with some key terminology associated with molecular geometries in three dimensions. A bond angle is the angle between two bonds. So looking at two bonds sharing a common atom, we can define the angle between them as the angle between, say, these two CH lines right here. For example, in formaldehyde, the HCH bond angle is 118 degrees. The bond length, which is a term we've seen before, is just the distance between the nuclei in their equilibrium positions along the axis joining the nuclei, essentially the shortest distance between those two points, the nuclear points. The bond length, for example, in formaldehyde of the CO linkage is 1.21 angstroms. What we want to be able to do is go from a Lewis structure all the way through to predictions of the bond angles and, roughly speaking, the bond lengths associated with the bonds in this molecule. So could we start, for example, with CH2O, just this, develop a reasonable Lewis structure for it, and then from that Lewis structure infer this picture. By the time we get done, you will be able to do this. And the conceptual model, the framework, the theory we use to go from a Lewis structure to a geometry is known as VSEPR or VSEPR theory. In full, that's valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. And that is a complicated set of words for a very simple idea. Electrons repel one another. The electron clouds associated with bonding regions and non-bonding or unshared or lone pairs of electrons repel one another and get as far apart from one another as they possibly can. In maximizing the distance between themselves, the electron clouds assume a set of standardized shapes. There aren't that many possibilities if we're talking about maximizing the distance between the electron clouds or minimizing the repulsion, if you like. For that reason, we can start with a Lewis structure, examine what's called the steric number, the number of regions of electron density or electron clouds around the central atom. That steric number implies what's called an electron pair geometry, the arrangement, the ideal arrangement in terms of minimizing electron-electron repulsion of the electron clouds around the central atom. From that, an appreciation of the number of bonds and non-bonding lone pairs in the structure, we can infer what's called the molecular geometry, or sometimes the shape. And this just refers to the arrangement of the atoms around the central atom, sort of disregarding the non-bonding lone pairs. They do have a profound impact on the shape, but in thinking about the shape in three dimensions, we tend not to think about the lone pairs when we're talking about molecular geometry. So there's a subtle distinction here that we'll explore as we get into the details of Vesper theory. First, we're going to survey the possible electron pair geometries. In this table, we have as the first row the number of regions, or what we would call the steric number, associated with the central atom in the structure. And this we'll be able to infer from the Lewis structure. And we'll practice this in practice problems a little bit later. In more detail, it's simply the number of regions of electron density around the atom. And to determine this, by the way, we count double and triple bonds as a single region, a single electron cloud, because the double and triple bond essentially do represent a single contiguous region of electron density. When the central atom has two regions of electron density around it, we're looking at a linear 
geometry. And let me pull up an interactive that will allow us to see this in three dimensions. Here's the linear geometry, and we can see that 180 degree bond angle between the two groups attached to the central atom in purple here. When I add a third region of electron density, watch what happens. We spring out and we get something that looks like a triangle, if you're paying attention to the three atoms on the outside edge here, with 120 degree bond angles between the three sets of bonds. This is what's known as trigonal planar. If we add a fourth region of electron density, we're now at 109.5 degree bond angles, and this is known as the tetrahedral geometry, and it really brings us into the third dimension. You can see that sort of regardless of how we position this, there are going to be bonds pointed towards us and away from us in three dimensions. A fifth region of electron density leads to the trigonal bipyramidal electron group arrangement or electron geometry. Here we have a trigonal plane with two groups or lone pairs above and below that trigonal plane. This is known as trigonal bipyramidal because it sort of looks like two trigonal pyramids sharing a base. And finally, if we add a sixth region of electron density, a sixth electron cloud, we're now at the octahedral geometry, which sort of looks like Cartesian axes, I always imagine the x, y, and z axes in three dimensions is sort of what the octahedral geometry looks like. And these are, for our purposes, the only five possibilities. Since for a given number of regions of electron density around a central atom, there's only one way to optimally position the electron clouds to minimize electron-electron repulsion. That's the beauty of Vesper theory. Now what we just surveyed are what we call the electron group arrangements or electron pair geometries. And these are the arrangements of the electron clouds around the central atom regardless of whether we're thinking about the electron cloud as being a lone pair or a bond. This is not the same thing as the molecular geometry or shape in cases where the central atom bears one or more lone pairs. And so while they can be the same, in a molecule like CH4, which only has four single bonds linked to the central atom, they're often not. And the molecule NH3, or ammonia, is a great example of this. Ammonia bears a lone pair and three bonds to hydrogen associated with the central nitrogen atom. So it has four electron domains, or four electron clouds. It has the tetrahedral electron pair geometry. If we sort of forget about the existence of the lone pair temporarily and look at this figure B, we'll see that this doesn't exactly look tetrahedral. It's missing that fourth group. If we look only at the positions of the atoms, this looks like a trigonal pyramid. This is what's known as the pyramidal or pyramidal molecular geometry. And one last point to mention is that the true structure of ammonia doesn't have those idealized tetrahedral bond angles of 109.5 degrees that we just saw. In fact, the actual bond angle in ammonia is significantly smaller at 106.8 degrees. The reason has to do with additional repulsion of this somewhat larger non-bonding lone pair and the bonding electrons. The bonding electrons sort of get smushed into a smaller bond angle as a result of repulsion from the non-bonding lone pair. The big lesson of this slide, though, is that electron pair geometry and molecular geometry are not the same. The good news is we can infer molecular geometry from the electron pair geometry and an understanding of how many lone pairs the central atom bears. So on this slide, we have sort of a grand survey of all the possible molecular geometries. And to determine molecular geometry, we don't just need the steric number, which is here listed in the first column. We need the steric number, which tells us the electron pair geometry and the number of lone pairs at the central atom. In this first column, we have the case of zero lone pairs at the central atom, and these are nice. In all of these cases, the molecular geometry matches the electron pair geometry, linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, etc. When one lone pair comes in, that lone pair is sort of ignored in naming the molecular geometry. So for example, the trigonal planar geometry, electron pair geometry with one lone pair is called bent or angular. 
the tetrahedral geometry with one lone pair. The tetrahedral electron pair geometry with one lone pair is called trigonal pyramidal or pyramidal, on and on from there. So I'll let you take a look at these on your own, won't go into them in detail, but we will look at a couple of special cases where lone pairs can be placed at distinct positions. One that I'll point out here, for instance, is the sawhorse or seesaw structure, where this lone pair is placed not at one of the positions above or below the trigonal plane of the trigonal bipyramidal electron pair geometry, but in the trigonal plane. That's interesting, and that continues as we move to more than one lone pair in the TBP electron pair geometry. So the T-shaped geometry has two lone pairs in the trigonal plane, and if we've got three lone pairs, all three of the lone pairs occupy the trigonal plane, and we end up at a linear shape with three lone pairs in the trigonal bipyramidal electron pair geometry. Generally, and this is actually true of the trigonal bipyramidal geometry and can be most clearly seen if you look at the octahedral examples, we want to put those lone pairs as far apart from one another as we possibly can. For example, generating a square planar arrangement when we have two lone pairs in an octahedral geometry, getting the lone pairs as far apart from one another as we possibly can.